I should start. Okay, excellent. So, this is about paradox, if you haven't noticed. Um, contact information we already. So let me tell you a little bit about who, who I am so you have some idea who's talking to you. So I'm Johannes. Um, my back, I'm a geek. Um, there's an entrepreneurial bent. And I have done all sorts of things from better stuff to big data stuff. Uh, theoretically, I'm a hardware person because that's what they taught me in school. Uh, but practically, I've been doing software all day, um, basically all of my life. Uh, currently, I have a little company called Indie Computing down in Silicon Valley. Here's its uh, logo. Uh, and we are building a bunch of stuff, one of which is UBoss, which is a Linux distro uh, that is optimized to self-hosting. Uh, self-hosting as in you, for example, here was the master example, let's say you would like to run your own master server, that tends to be a big pain, and so UBoss is uh, made to make this uh, much, much simpler. Um, and I don't want to talk about this very much, but that's, um, check it out. If you self-host anything, you might want to check out uh, UBoss because everything you might want to conceivably want to do on that machine is one command. Okay. Like install and update and backup and all these things. Um, we package this thing in a hardware appliance called the UBoss box. And uh, there, there's different hardware versions, but uh, this is one of, the, one of the pictures here based on the Intel NUC. Uh, so it becomes a home server that currently running Nextcloud. Um, actually, I was just thinking about it a year ago. I was in this very room when the Nextcloud guys were, were talking about um, file sharing and on the hardware you own and countering and all of that. And we have actually been giving away one yesterday and uh, today another one, the, uh, the raffle, um, if you like um, one of those home servers. What we're trying to do is uh, bring our data home. The basic philosophy is there's too much of our data in the hands of other people. So there's a common theme in what I'm talking about, which is there is data that is personal to me. And if the data is actually valuable, as everybody says, how come everybody has it except for me? All right? So <clears throat> let's talk about this one first. Um, this is a picture uh, of um, what used to be a town called Paradise, California. That's what happened after it. So you can see there's not much left there. Um, here's my uh, personal version of the story. When I was at uh, CGL in uh, Seattle in the last year, I flew back to, um, to back home to California. That was a pic uh, picture out of the airplane. You can see here from you know, 30 or 40,000 feet, you can see the fire here. Uh, and it went here for a few hundred miles all the way home. Um, biggest, uh, most deadly uh, wildfire in California history. And the reason why I'm, uh, why I'm mentioning this one is because it got me thinking, which is this thing burned 27, uh, 70,000 acres in 24 hours, which is a 10 by 10 mile square, 24 hours, okay? And yeah, people died because it just happened too fast. So the, the thing that got me thinking is, if this happened to me, here I am, um, in a disaster like this, if people die, I don't care about laptops and backups and any of this stuff, I just run, right? But I have personal data, what, 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 what exactly happens here? Um, and and um, you know, Paradox, the, the uh, thing that I'm talking about today is actually named after that, uh, Paradise Redux, because it's gonna happen again. <laughs> That's where I uh, took the name from. Um, and uh, I should say it's a very early stage uh, project. Uh, I just released the version 0.1. Uh, this is the first time I'm talking about it. Uh, what I'm really looking for here is people tell me that the scheme doesn't actually work or should work differently. It's a pure open source project, um, and I would love to have uh, contributors um, if people think that this is you know, personal data is something that, that, is, um, that is helpful. So if you think that, oh yeah, I have backups and I put it into the local bank, as some geeks tell me, or in the local lockbox of the bank, you know, this is a picture of the bank in town. I don't know whether they had any lock boxes. I wasn't able to research that. But if they did, uh, chances are your backups at the local bank probably didn't make it either. Right? So all of the things we usually do to protect our data, even as geeks that think we have things under control, may not work so well. So this is what Paradox is designed for. What if everything fails? And um, let's look at uh, you know let's look at what, what are the scenarios and what what, what we want to protect against. So here's disaster scenarios such as the fire burns your house and everything in it. And because you had backups on site, it burns your backups as well. That's one scenario. There's different versions of this. Let's say you keep your laptop or your phone with you 
you're lucky, right? You had it in your car, you just keep it in your car or in your pocket. So you can have, still have some access to some things, such as, for example, uh, if you still have access to your email, chances are you at least remember where your online accounts are and you can do password resets and stuff like that. Maybe you have your password manager with all of your passwords with you, but maybe you don't. Um, maybe you can't remember your root email password. What I mean by that one is whatever account you're using to sign up for online services. Uh, in my case, it's Gmail. Uh, if I lost access to that account, I'd be in trouble uh, on various levels. For example, I would not, I'm not really have a good way of remembering which online services I'm subscribed to with which usernames. Uh, I counted about 15 years ago, I counted, uh, because I was involved in this thing called OpenID at the time, I was counting how many online accounts do I have. 15 years ago, I start, uh, stopped counting at 200. Um, and that was 15 years ago. And, you know, that has, of course, gone up uh, ever since. What if you can't even remember anything yourself? You're temporarily out of commission because you got hit on the head or you got injured in that disaster, or maybe you're permanently out of commission. It happens, people die. All right. Now, you personally may not want to recover your data, but you may have some survivors who might. And uh, just what exactly happens then? And there's different kinds of impact from the very obvious, from the very you know, straightforward, how do you make it to the next 48 hours? I mean, can you get out any money? Can you, in my case, I don't even remember, I realized uh, what the phone numbers of my kids are. My phone knows what the phone numbers are, I don't. They change them so frequently, I can't remember this. <laughs> Um, can you recover all your money? Well, you might be able to re recover most of your money, but you may not be able to re uh, recover your Bitcoin or your Monero or whatever you might have. Uh, that was all going away one way or the other. <laughs> That's one thing. Uh, you might have some bank account. I, I, for example, I'm originally from Germany. I still have a bank account in uh, Germany. Uh, I'm quite certain that my wife could not get at that uh, bank account. If you know all the information that I have in the binder um, went away, it would be practically very difficult. I mean, there's not much money in it, but nevertheless. Um, can you continue to earn the same living? Uh, unclear if all the people you ever pitched your services to have gone away for some reason because your email is not accessible anymore. Unclear. Uh, can you recover all your email? Can you recover all your family photos? That's an important one. I've been asking people where they put their family photos for years. Okay. You put them all on Facebook, you think they're still there when your kids are grand, uh, grandparents themselves and want to show you know, the baby pictures to their grandchildren. And um, most people look at me like, oh, I never thought of that. And the people who have thought about it said, oh yeah, I have a hard drive at home. <laughs> and I have a copy of everything I posted online on my hard drive. Well, that might also be gone, right? In this kind of scenario. And of all of this, this might actually be the most valuable um, um, data that, uh, that there is. And then, of course, uh, if you don't make it, can your surviving spouse and children get access to any of this data? So this is what I'm, the problem that I'm trying to make a difference in. Um, so usually it goes like, you know, do some backups, uh, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. And the whole problem here is this one. This is the worst possible disaster. Not only do you not remember anything, but you're actually gone. Can we still recover? And I figure if I can solve that problem, okay, then, you know, all the other problems are solvable. Okie dokie. So there's other disasters that have kind of similar impact, uh, not just natural disasters. Burglary can be, some people are being burglared. Um, malware attacks can be. All right. If you are really being attacked by malware, uh, you may have all the world's backups, but you may be completely unable to get at any of them. <coughs> so, so if I'm saying something that makes no sense to you, please do speak up. This is not a very large group, so you know, let's, let's speak up here. Um, but also, and you might not think about this one. Google may decide that you are really evil, and so they might disable your account. It has happened. Right? We are not living in a democracy, at least as it relates to uh, online services. As a result, you have no uh, recourse. If they decide they don't like you, you can't get at your stuff anymore. And that can be um, fatal to, uh, to your business. Uh, to, you know, if you search online, there's plenty of stories like that. Okay, or Flickr, you know, whatever your online services, your photos might be gone for the same reason. They okay. can just plain lose it too. That happens. Uh, what was this MySpace thing the other day? Uh, where I well, mean, for, for, forget the pikers. Microsoft has lost data of mine. Okay. If Microsoft can lose your data, any cloud service can lose your data. So let's define the problem. What what what? How does this shape and the structure of the problem look like? The first thing is that we have personal data in several locations, right? Um, it is, uh, and any one of those locations can disappear without warning. 
let's take out you know, this laptop, or take out that server, or take out that cloud service. And of course, if you don't have backups, you know, nothing good can happen. So, so I presume that you know, if you have data that's valuable in only one copy, there, there's nothing anybody can do. So th that's the, the table stakes for everything we talk about, uh, because you know, the hard drive dies, that's the end of it. All right? And so, but also several uh, locations of this data can disappear uh, without warning. Um, and this means, one of the data location here that we have is, might include your memory. So if that memory, inc uh, if you require to, uh, your memory to be intact to recover, for example, oh, I know, I backed this up to this online location, <coughs> right, right, then that, that doesn't really work if the memory isn't there anymore. So online location is one of the places uh, that, you, that we have to deal with, um, remembering that. Uh, and the other one is um, uh, encryption or any kind of access credentials, how you actually can make use of the data even if you know where it is. And so we want to be able to recover all of this without, of course, uh, enabling data theft by somebody who thinks, oh, this is very cool. Uh, I can exploit that scheme. Okay, here's a, a more detailed version of this one. So we have mobile devices, laptops, desktops, home service, backup service like air capsule. My, my Mac backs up to an air capsule at home. Um, some people have colo service for their personal data. I don't think many, but some do. Uh, there's cloud service and disks. Um, and I distinguish between these two where you have essentially arbitrary file storage that you put there, and the other one is like a SaaS kind of application level storage. So this one would be Amazon S3, for example, and this one would be Facebook. Uh, because they both have personal data, but the, the shapes and structure of it are, are, are very, very different. But then also, some of the data might be in a lockbox at home. All right. For example, you might have a password recovery ski, uh, sheet that's in, uh, in, in a lockbox at home, or you might have put it in the bank. Some people do that, some people give it to their friends, uh, in your head, in your spouse's head. And here's an important observation. There is relationships between all of these things. These are not independent pieces of data. But for example, it might be that the data that's on my laptop is backed up to a cloud server after I encrypt it with a key that's currently you know, in, a, um, in a file on my laptop, in a password manager, right? Uh, which I get at, can get at through a password recovery sheet that I have in my lockbox. These are complicated relationships. So if a survivor, for example, were, supposed to, were going to uh, have to recover that data, they will have to traverse that relationship. Right? Otherwise, you, they can't get at, at, um, uh, at what's going on. And so let me go now switch over to how does this paradox thing actually work. So the first thing, because uh, the, the first thing needs to happen is we need to create a data inventory. What a, this is sort of an enterprise -y term. But basically, we need to write down of all the data we have. If we don't write down what all the data we have and where it is, recovery is really not possible. You might be able to recover because you remember where it is, but one of the failure scenarios right, we have is that you don't remember, so it has to be written down. And so um, the documentation, it's basically documentation for you and your survivors, but it is also a basis for automation. So I have a Paradox version 0 0.1 um, uh, piece of software where there's very little automation. But if you have this you know, captured, you can do interesting stuff, such as, for example, do the automatic backups you want or monitoring the fact that these things exist. Um, and of course, this information is highly sensitive, right? If somebody knows where all your data is and how to get access to it, I didn't mention this one, the data inventory in itself doesn't help you unless you also know to, uh, uh, document how to get at it. So if you had an S3 account, you know, that it is in this particular bucket, doesn't help anybody. But what helps is the S3 bucket name and the credentials to how to get at it. So if you have the credentials as well, then this becomes highly sensitive. So we need to protect this adequately. So for step one is creating a data um, inventory. Number two is securing that data inventory. And in the, um, in the current implementation, uh, I just grabbed a uh, looks encrypted volume, which seems easy. This, does everybody knows what that is? I, I don't know what, uh, who doesn't? There are other encrypted volumes, but I haven't used so. So this is just, you know, given this is a NIST conference, so <coughs> LUX is basically a scheme by which you can take a file. That's a simple version. You can have to take a file and you declare this to be a hard drive, essentially. 
and it has a bunch of uh, credentials on top, or a bunch of encryption on top, but it looks, to the operating system, it looks like one file, but you can go inside and you have a, a structure underneath. And I wasn't initially um, um, planning to use this, but I figured out this is actually a very simple uh, way to get started. And we put two credentials, it looks supports, I think, up to eight different credentials by which you can, uh, uh, or secrets by which you can access the thing, and we're using two. One which I call the everyday password, and one which I call the recovery key, uh, oh, secret, uh, recovery key. The everyday password is something that you put in your head, and only in your head, that you use on an everyday basis to access this thing. Whenever you have to access this, for example, you, you know, add another hard drive to your home network, or you get a new laptop, or you know, there's some other data location you want to change the data inventory that you have, you use the everyday password. And that's something that's in your head only, it isn't written down, so if you forget it, it's gone. But it can also not be stolen because it's never written down. And you can make this relatively short, um, so it's easy to, to access. Then we have a second one, which is a recovery key that's much longer. It's essentially a random number that is, you know, I don't know, 500 as well bytes, uh, bits or some, some such thing. And that recovery key exists uh, really nowhere as a full key but it is uh, broken into eight K pieces, K is on some integer number, I think three, um, with a scheme called the Shamir uh, Secret Sharing. Now, I'm not a crypto guy, but it's an interesting scheme. Who um, knows what that is, the Shamir Secret Sharing? Oh, it's a bunch of people. Okay, let me, for, for the rest, uh, let's ma make it very simple. Um, here's the example that people ate. Let's say you are a bank, and there's a bank safe, and there's a lot of money in it, and you want to say that you need at least two people to open the safe, okay? You, you aren't giving anybody the, 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 um, uh, the uh, key to the safe because you don't trust the, the people who work there, but you know, if you have to have at least two or maybe or three or maybe five people, some, some number, they have to collaborate so they can open up the safe. Well, that works if you basically just take a long code and break it into five chunks, for example, and give these five different chunks to five different people. The trouble is, if one of those falls out for whatever reason, they're sick, they're dead, they're, they're quit, whatever it is, you're dead. Uh, you can't recover. So this Shamir uh, secret sharing thing, scheme basically lets you break a secret into as many pieces as you want. Usually it's called N pieces, say 10 pieces. But you only have to have K, such as three, any three out of the 10 to recover. So you could say 10 bank employees have access to the safe um, or have a piece of the secret and any three of them can get into the safe, but two of them cannot. And it doesn't matter which three it is. And it sounds a little bit like magic if you think of it, right? So, so if you're not a crypto person like me, it's a little bit of magic, but it's actually uh, quite straightforward, uh, straightforward if you remember your algebra. Basically what it does is what, it, what, what he does is basically he says, oh, uh, if you remember polynomials, uh, if you have enough points, let's say you have a third degree polynomial, if you have enough points, you can recover the polynomial, right? For a, for a constant function, you need one point. For a linear function, you need two points. Um, and it doesn't matter which points it are, as long as you know po two points, you know what it is. And so if you want something five, you do, uh, f five points, then you take a, a fifth degree a polynomial. Uh, and uh, you, you distribute the five points for the fifth degree polynomial to five people, or, 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 or so many points, on, you know, to as many people if you like, but five of them are sufficient to recover the polynomial, and one of the constants in your polynomial is the secret. Oh, that's pretty straightforward. There is a little bit of addition to this, but it, which is what they do here is it's all integer uh, modulo arithmetic rather than floating point. As a result, it's less uh, crackable. Uh, but um, it's actually quite straightforward uh, if, you, if you think of it, except that the documentation that I found, just as a side note, is all pretty terrible. Uh, it took me a long time to just realize, oh, this is much simpler than they seem to make it out. <laughs> anyway, so what we do is we take the long recovery key by which we can recover getting at a lex volume and break it into k pieces. It's gone. The, the whole key is really ne never stored anywhere. Um, but the K pieces, oh, sorry, we break it into N pieces actually. Uh, this should be saying N, but K is required, which is a smaller number, to recover uh, the key. And then we distribute things. We distribute, first of all, the many copies of the secure data inventory that we create here in lots of places. Why in lots of places? So we can recover. 
even if one goes away, uh, or five go away, uh, or you can't remember or get at them, whatever it is, you can dis distribute it pretty broadly. Because, uh, and we do that uh, without, the, uh, uh, without the everyday password. So that gets stripped first. That's attackable because it's relatively short. So we strip that off, and then only the one that has a long recovery key on it gets distributed pretty broadly. So you put it in a public bucket on S3. Okay? And you know, if you die and you don't pay your Amazon bill, that bucket might go away. But you can also put it into so many other places, uh, as many as you like. Um, that, that's up to the, to the user. And so, so the, the objective here is that not all the copies disappear at once. Uh, we strip off the every password. And then we take the, um, the key fragments, the pieces that we had put this uh, recovery key uh, into, and distribute it to what are called stewards here. Think of it as trusted friends. So you find, um, you find you know, 10 people that you reasonably trust. You don't have to perfectly trust them because any one of them can't actually do anything against you. But it might be you know, some relatives, some friends uh, say, you know, the only thing you really have to do here is uh, store a little bit of data for me. And it might be as simple as a sheet of paper or a USB stick. And if something bad happens, I might call you up and say, I, I need access to your paper. Or if, you know, if I die, uh, my survivor might come by and say, I might, ha I might need access to your data. And if so, please cooperate. I mean, after you validate that it is actually somebody legitimate. Um, and um, not all of the stewards may be still around at the time you're asking, or they may not cooperate, or they're on vacation, or you know, in jail, or what to put you know. Uh, so you only need a K out of N to recover. That's the basics of the scheme. I'm not seeing as much confidence in the faces of you guys as I would hope. <laughs> yes? Can you address that last bullet point, also just check with the locations? Oh, yeah. So I didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't um, mention this one. So, so I have this file, this looks image file. It has lots of interesting stuff in it. Where's my data and how does it relate, right? And how do we recover it? So what I do is I secure it. And I have to distribute it into as many places as I like so I can recover from it. But nobody knows where these locations are unless I tell them, right? Because my memory might go away too. So what I do is, let's say I'm uploading it to uh, S3 and I put it in my bank vault and I give it to my friend, uh, friend um, George, right? So I'm also distributing to my stewards where to get the data from. So that goes over here. So it's actually 4A, 4B. Fragments and right, so, so there's, there, yeah, in parallel, there, there's, there's this thing we call the steward package, which is basically the stuff that the steward gets. You know, people don't want to deal with this, they don't know what this is, they don't have to understand what this is. But uh, think of it as a sheet of paper. I'm giving you a sheet of paper, and I have an example in just a minute. Uh, basically, uh, here's all the things you need to know to participate in that scheme. And that's primarily the piece of the key over here, and then also where to get the um, data from so you can recover. Yes? So in this scheme, the everyday password is uh, as close for accessing it and backing it up or updating the data set? Is yes. That correct? Okay. But wouldn't that be also uh, uh, that exposes you uh, technically to like online resource attacks if somebody gets a hold of it or something and then gets that data? So, so that's supposedly a easily memorable one? So this, the, the one with the everyday uh, password only s sits, for example, on my laptop or at home somewhere on, on a machine that has physical security. When I upload it to S3, I strip the everyday password first. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so what's online is, so of the two secrets, so I, I said of the eight key slots that Lux has, we to use two, one for the every password and one for the recovery uh, secret, and the first one of those gets stripped before it gets uploaded. So in the backup medium, everyday password won't help us at all? Uh, exactly. Okay. So, so then if I, for example, now don't remember my everyday password, all right, because I didn't write it down, that's, that's important for the security, uh, otherwise somebody can find that and, uh, and, uh, and recover it that way. Um, so uh, then I actually have to call up my stewards and say, I need, uh, need to recover from the, from the recovery key. Yes? Um, my question would be because a lot of this data isn't going to be something that's like static. Um, that have you thought of anything like in the architecture for making it so that you don't have to, well, like I'm assuming with this paradigm, what you have to do is essentially blow away everything like in your S3 library. No. no, no. So once you set up, uh, and there, there's two, there's two pieces here. One of which is the essentially the what's inside that looks volume, and then there is the secret to it. 
what I distribute to my stewards is, is a piece of the secret. So unless I change that secret, and there's no particular reason why I should change it because it never gets used by anybody unless it is being re recovered. So that can very easily you know, stay there for 10 years or longer. There is no updates are required. The most likely updates are that my stewards, you know, I'm not friends with my steward anymore or they move away or, or something like that, uh, in which case I can uh, generate more, more key friend things. But what's inside the encrypted volume, I can update anytime I want. The, uh, so that's what the everyday password is for. So there is a command, paradox, edit, you know, data sets. And then uh, currently it doesn't do that because we have version 0.1. But what it should do at the end of the edit cycle when you say, oh, I have a new backup device, like my, I have now installed a time capsule in my home and I have added this to my, list, uh, to my data inventory. Then once I save, uh, currently just updates the, uh, the uh, local volume. But what should happen is it gets pushed out to all of those locations automatically. So, I'm, so what I'm wondering is how does that, like what does that process look like? Like are we doing full, like is it an incremental like, so the, sync or is it everything all so at once? The amount of data here is very I, I guess it's because I don't understand Flux. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's just an image file. Yeah, so Lux, uh, the way it works is for the encrypted volume that you're interested in encrypting, which could be a whole disk or a file, you have a header which has a very good randomly generated password that actually is the part of the, the encryption key. Then you use um, different schemes to encrypt that key, which you can use an everyday password or then a really long password. So there's a two-step process so that you can always um, be updating the keys that let you decrypt the so, so um, I was actually even talking about this once because that's not that's not material to the, to the, the scheme here. So, but if you think of the, um, this is basically a file. In our case, about twenty megabytes because that seems to be a reasonable size. It looks doesn't want to have very small files. It has very little data on it. So basically, what we do is after this um, this data inventory gets updated, we update we are uploading a file worth twenty megabytes okay, so to like five online servers. Any of the data itself, and that's. Yeah. But it's in, it's inside that encrypted volume. But basically, it's no different from any kind of a movie file or you know ISO or something that you might upload. Except that you can't get at it unless you have either of those two, and we only upload it when the everyday password is gone. Yes. But what would actually be in the looks encrypted? I volume get there. Just like like a CSV or something with your list of all your data locations and not the actual data. Well, in the credentials. Yeah. yeah. So okay. So exactly. So. Data inventory, what does it contain? The locations of all the data, the relationships between the data, um, the access credential, and then if some of them are backups and they, you have encrypted them, how to decrypt them again. So here is, uh, let's say, here's an example. And so right now I said that it's all very basic, so you have to edit JSON files. Because I figured if I can edit JSON files and it works, you know, I can always put a GUI on top or, or something to make this pretty. It's, it's pretty has to work. So. Currently it's a JSON file, um, data sets, and so that's any number of data sets here. Uh, here's the first one, it says, I give it a name, um, and the source of the data set is, and I give it a name so that I understand what this is, that's the home directory of my laptop, and it has a URL, uh, how to get at it. Uh, and I use a URL here already, also it's not automated, so I could derive a backup script from it directly. Mm -hmm. All right? And here is some credentials. So I can believe that I could use this data to write a cron job of some kind, mm -hmm. all right? And on a periodic basis, you know, SSH um, via rsync via SSH into my uh, laptop on the local network using these particular credentials to pull data out. So if, if you think of it, Paradox, uh, one way of looking at it, it is somewhere in the middle between a password manager and a backup system. And it has com components of both. Right now it doesn't do either very well, but, um, but it sort of ties them together in something that is um, made for recovery and, and, and then for uh, automation. So this would be the source, the series here is the primary source of the data, and if I have uh, backups, let's say for example I'm backing it up to my Apple time capsule, then I do document where that is, I would document you know, where is this thing. So people can recover, oh, this is the, you know, I would say maybe it has a blue sticker on it and it currently sits on the shelf so people know what I'm talking about. You have to have some real world uh, identification for actual hardware devices. 
And this one would be frequency, so, so that would be outside of the scheme of um, trying to do the background ourselves because Apple does whatever the Apple does on that uh, on that subject. But it could be it could, if this wasn't Apple, it would be let's say S3. You could say you know this runs every 24 hours, and this is what should happen. Now again, we haven't implemented that in the, in, in Paradox, but we could uh, theoretically we could drive a, a backup, uh, you know, any kind of open source or commercial backup uh, system off that information. Uh, here's another one. Okay, let's say we go to Amazon S3. This is where the data sits. Here are the credentials, how to get at it. Uh, here's how often it gets updated. Um, and uh, here's maybe some uh, GPG keys or something that I might be using in order to back, uh, to encrypt the thing first before I upload it to S3. So, so I go in that given website. So, so basically, when I in my step one, I define what my data is. I'm basically creating a long data, uh, a long JSON file that says I have those data sets, <laughs> with the relationships between them. So within one data, um, with, within one data set, I describe all the copies of that data that exist. So when my when my laptop dies, for example, I can go into the set and say where else does this data exist? And there's documentation here, like how how current is it? Oh, you know, this is updated once a day. So I know. Should I recover from here or should I recover from here? Yes? So one suggestion I would have for that would be to add some sort of concept of a local source so that if you were actually running the cron job from your laptop, you, know, you don't have to add it on the network with whatever is actually yes. doing it. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff like that this needs to occur. So for example, it's a little unclear where to logically run this. Uh, laptop is not such a great idea because you lose it and then you have the recovery problems on its own already. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the home server business, so the logical thing for me to run is on our home server, but other people might run it somewhere else. Okay, so then we, do, we talked about this already. Uh, let me skip through this. Uh, we talked about this in one way or another. Here is what we distribute to a uh, steward. This is essentially how it looks like, or could look like. Uh, and that's the text we currently uh, generate. Um, I didn't show a similar JSON file where I define who my stewards are, but one of those stewards is apparently called JMO, and, um, and it basically uh, describes something that somebody who doesn't remember five years down the road that they agreed to do something, okay, and comes across the sheet of paper, still has some idea what this is all about. So it explains what it is. Um, it captures the version number of the code that's being used, which is probably going to be important from a recovery perspective. Here is the recovery fragments that you have. It's basically long numbers. And then here is the recovery data where you can get it from. So in order to recover, basically, we go here, download one of those things, collect enough of those fragments, reinstall Paradox, and recover. Yes? Uh, this is an alternative to what about using geocaching for your fragments. Geocaching. Uh, sure. Uh, so, see, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the question is then um, y you have to still distribute where are these things because if it's just in your head, that doesn't help. No, no, no. You have to do the live launch or some other. But you have to convey the information where it is to somebody else, which is essentially this. So, what you would have is one of the locations here would be, and then go dig here. <laughs> This is excellent. We have lots of innovation in the room. I am looking forward to lots of Bitcoin and geocaching related uh, pull requests. First, you have to capture a shiny Pokemon. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So now let me talk a little bit about the implementation. There is a little piece of Python uh, called Paradox, uh, which uh, sits on GitHub. And you start with Paradox in it. And what it basically does is it sets up that uh, Lux volume and sets up their credentials. So you're being asked for your everyday password, and it sets up a random, um, uh, basically a random number for a recovery key. Um, right, and it creates a bunch of templates for the data files. And then there is a bunch of uh, subcommands. So for example, Paradox edit data sets, and that's basically a wrapper around your favorite editor. And what it does, it mounts, it asks you for your, for your everyday password, it mounts the uh, uh, Lux volume, uh, it runs your editor so you can edit it. Uh, when you uh, when you're done, uh, you are um, you save it. It runs a JSON checker on it, so you're not doing something stu stupid. Uh, and basically, tells you you know something's wrong here. Error reporting definitely needs more work, but at least it does some uh, some checking. 
and then when you're done and it passes muster, it um, currently just unmounts the Lux volume again, so it's un inaccessible again. What it should be doing then is automatically push it to the cloud services uh, or wherever you have uh, we have the interrupted versions. It all, there is uh, currently a uh, command called export datasets, which basically takes the uh, Lux volume strips off the uh, the uh, everyday password. So there are bits and pieces there, but it is not you know all tied together yet. A uh, similar scheme at its stewards that happens to be a, a separate uh, um, JSON file uh, because it's a different you know, action. Uh, you're thinking about it differently. Uh, it's e easier that way to not mess up stuff. Uh, when you edit your stewards, by and large, um, uh, it depending, there's two scenarios, one of which is when you completely get rid of the whole scheme and start again from scratch, which hopefully doesn't happen very often. What's more likely is that some steward drops out or they say, oh, I forgot my, I lost my recovery sheet or, or something. Then you can say, that's okay. You know, I handed out 10 and I need three out of 10. Now, now it's only nine, that's okay. But you might also say, I'm gonna add another steward. Um, uh, so you can generate more uh, as, as you like. And that's a, the, what the implementation is a little different from the usual Shamir uh, secret sharing thing is you can add more shares after, afterwards. As soon as you add more stewards, it generates more shares. <coughs> um, yeah, I said this already, so um, yeah, currently we only export to a local directory, uh, but that needs to get pushed up. And then, um, right, so export steward packages, what that does is basically it generates a version of the text that I showed earlier. Uh, currently it just prints as a standard out, you know, version 0 0.1. Uh, the idea is that it would either send to a printer so that you just have, you know, 10 sheets of paper that, you know, can distribute. Well, what would be nice uh, probably is uh, insert 10 different USB sticks uh, because it's just a lot more practical uh, to have actually a computer form of that very long integer number <laughs> than something you have to type back in. Uh, these, these you know, secrets, even the split ones are, are fairly long and we want them to be long because uh, security is better if they're, if they're long. Yes? What about getting them printed to uh, Sapphire disk? Given that the USB sticks only going to last about 10 years. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is open source software. You know, this is the kind of thing where we, we, we should do. And I, I don't know what the answer is. So this is the same thing right now. Currently, this is standard out only. Uh, it should, you know, perhaps do all sorts of other things. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason that emailing out the steward information would be uh, inappropriate, or would that be something which would be too easy to leak out to untrusted parties? So if you have, let's say, 10 stewards and all of them you are going to email this thing to and you're all going through uh, somebody else's SMTP server and you're not using um, uh, you know, point to point encryption, yeah. you just give away your recovery secret to Google. <laughs> uh, and everybody who you know, siphons the data off Google. And depending who you are, that may actually be you know, critical. But it, it, you know, it depends what your threat model is, right? It, it boils down to what is your uh, personal threat model and then what is the amount of inconvenience you're willing to go through and you're going to be willing to put your stewards or your survivors through, right? It, it is very easy to make uh, data so secure that nobody can get at it ever again. Well, uh, SPS still has the kindest legal protection for transferring data. <laughs> right. Okay, so recovery, uh, let's see, what are we doing? Just a little bit of time. Uh, so here are some scenarios. Let's see, how do we recover? Something bad happened. Um, in the first scenario, we still have the, the box that we had Paradox installed. Um, we have no, uh, no amnesia, but we forgot what the, uh, uh, but, but, sorry, but what uh, one of our data um, um, elements went away, uh, say that, such as the laptop was stolen, or the phone fell to the pool, or something. Okay, so basically what you say, Paradox status data sets, and it requires the everyday password, and it tells us, you know, where's the data backup to, and now we can recover, because we know where, where it went. And we now have all the information necessary to recover. That's the simplest case, right? I'm recovering a, a data location that, that um, I have under control, and I'm still fully functional. Um, now, my, the box that Paradox was installed, and the uh, Lux image is on, okay, has gone away. Um, so now, what I will do, is uh, probably one of my own stewards. I have the, one of those sheets myself. So I remember, uh, or, you know, I, I know from there where, where my Lux image went um, online. 
So I, um, um, oh right, um, let's see. Yes, so I download this Lux image, but I can't use my Arrival password anymore because I uploaded it without the everyday password, all right? It's the same scenario as if I forgot what my everyday password was, which in my case would happen. Um, and so I contact key of my stewards, they're all friends, right? Uh, basically say just, you know, read this number to me or, you know, I, I get it back. And so on a spare machine, I install Paradox again. There's a command called Paradox Recover. It takes that information in and it reconstitutes the recovery secret, asks you for a new everyday password, and you're back. Now, right now, this is a little clumsier than it should be, mostly because of 0 0.1. Um, right now, you have to uh, pipe this in in JSON format just to make it work. Um, so the, their usability is basically zero currently, but it, it does work. They're, they're, um, and then we you know, constantly go back to the previous scenario. Here is the recover everything full amnesia scenario. So the first question is, <laughs> who is actually wanting to recover? If there's full amnesia, nobody actually remembers there's anything to, re to recover, right? <laughs> Which is actually a problem, right? But somebody's going to ask. If nobody asks, it probably doesn't matter, and so yeah, we can stop right here. But somebody asked, why isn't there some data? Um, so the executor of your estate, or somebody else, power of attorney because you're in the hospital, or something, or you with amnesia, you're thinking, you know, I've been working in IT all my <laughs> life. There must be some data somewhere. <laughs> right? So you think something must be recovered. And so uh, you basically talk to your social network. You know, what, what you do in the real world scenario, scenario when that happens, you think, you know, I talked to my wife, said, didn't I have some data? Talked to my best friend, said, yeah, you gave me this strange sheet one day. And that's from where you start recovering. Oh, there's this scheme here. There's some data here, how does this work? And then, you know, eventually recover. So that's the worst possible uh, scenario. And then let's talk about the tax scenarios for a second. So the, there's two scenarios, one of which when the, the, when the volume is actually mounted, then if somebody can have access to all the secrets. You know, that's no different from when you run a password manager and you have it open. So it's a problem we don't have to solve in the sense that, you know, it has been solved or not solved. Uh, we're not going to contribute anything uh, to that particular uh, uh, problem. There's no reason you couldn't air gap the computer that you're doing this on, right? Yes. So, so for example, you, you're exactly right. It might make some sense to take a special purpose appliance, like a spare Raspberry Pi you have floating, floating around, and use that only for that purpose. Right, I mean, the hardware has become so cheap um, uh, that this is actually a possibility, yes. Um, and then the second scenario here is that uh, the attack against access to the encrypted data inventory, which happens very easily because you distribute it all over the uh, online. However, it is uh, it looks encrypted with a long secret that is not stored anywhere. You can't actually get it from anywhere because it's not stored anywhere. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we basically rely on the, that the uh, Lux guys uh, know what they're doing. Yes? Oh, um, I was just thinking, the, for the first scenario, you're going to be accessing this data so infrequently, would it just make sense to have uh, the application handle the mounting and unmounting of the... It, it does. Yeah. It does already. So when you say, um, when you say Paradox edit stewards, for example, then the first thing it does, it checks that the uh, Lux file exists, and if it exists, it mounts it with your password, and as soon as you're done editing, it unmounts it again. Okay. So, 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 so that window is only open for... Yes. Five and here's another attack scenario. Your stewards go rogue. It turns out that you are very rich and your you know, relatives were not as nice as you thought they were, right? So you need a conspiracy of these K stewards who all know each other, right? And are willing to conspire. So that is an attack scenario, right? It has happened, uh, that kind of thing. Now, for you to do something about that is you can vary the number K, require more people, so the conspiracy becomes harder. Right? Of course, it becomes clumsier for recovering because you need more people that uh, collaborate. Uh, and you also need to know each other. Uh, it's a little unlikely that people start conspiring that haven't known each other. So, for example, uh, if you now take a few stewards that are from your family and a few that are from a completely different part of your life that's unrelated to your family, the uh, likelihood that they start, uh, start uh, conspiring isn't so terribly high. So there's things you can do here to make this uh, um, less likely. Now, if they start conspiring, you know they have the they have the uh, um, way of screwing you, which is you know not a bug but a feature because if they couldn't do that, you couldn't recover. You know if you're dead or uh, incapacitated. So there's a trade-off here somewhere, and one can uh, play with different uh, 
where it is. Okay, so uh, implementation status, it's very early, as I said. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, needs to get done. Um, automation, reporting, user friendliness, recovery. It, it would be really nice to have this integrated with a password manager. Um, in fact, I'm a little unclear why the password manager hasn't really done anything innovative as far as I can tell in a long time. Uh, it would be nice if I didn't just have username passwords, but I could actually say, you know, this is how these things are related. And I, because they, they, what we do here is large, a lot of this functionality exists already in, in, in a password manager. So if anybody happens to work on a password manager project, uh, maybe that's the way actually where, where they should live and should perhaps be uh, added into it. What we don't have in the password manager world, I think, is that kind of, at least not that I know, is that kind of um, social recovery with, 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 uh, with fragments, which is a question for me anyway, why nobody has done that. Um, Keep but this open good. source issue of VR. Yeah, I, I know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities that one could do that, and one of the reasons I'm coming here is, so I run this to people like you who tell me that I'm you know, full of it, or that makes some sense, and maybe we can have some conversations of where it should, uh, where it should, where it should go. Okay, so it currently sits at github.com slash paradox. Um, it's Python 3, it's all very straightforward, should be easily understandable. Um, I can uh, show, uh, I show it if you like. Um, talk to me about whatever, this one or anything else. And I think we are out of time, is that true? Yes, we are. If you, um, if you want it, I can give you a very quick demo here on my Linux VM. Okay, so, so for example, I can say, Paradox, can you see that? Yeah. Maybe a little small here. Yeah. Font, control plus. Is that better? Yeah, I say par Paradox in it. And so it thinks for a little while because it generates the, um, uh, the uh, various secrets. And so here is my um, first, my everyday password that I'm setting. So it already set the uh, recovery password. Um, and in order to get at it, uh, I have to enter it again. And so by default, I'm just putting it into .paradox slash configuration.img. So you asked earlier about uh, what this Lux thing actually looks like. So, uh, so basically, that's the file. Right, it's currently you have 24, about 24 megabytes. It, uh, Lux doesn't want to be a lot smaller than that. It probably doesn't have enough redundancy to be uh, secure, so, but there's very little data in it. This is an empty directory that just happens to be where we mount the, the, um, um, the image. Let's say I want to edit uh, my stewards, then I say paradox edit steward. Actually, I should, maybe I should just a paradox here. So. so here are the commands. Well, this is Python art powers, if you know that. This is very strange to read, but here are the commands that we have. Change secrets, edit data sets, edit stewards, edit user. The user is just some user information that the sheet that's being generated has your information on it, so you remember, oh, that was Joe as opposed to somebody else. There is export configuration, um, which is the thing that um, uh, basically where we strip off the everyday password. Uh, then we have export steward packages, which is where we generate all these things that go to the stewards. Um, the init that just showed, recover is to recover it. And then there's some status commands that we can see uh, where we actually are. <coughs> Did somebody just want to see some? Oh, yes. I'm just curious, is the status stewards, uh, does that show you um, who your stewards currently are? So yes. So you can do an inventory and go, oh, I don't want it to be there or in. Okay. Right, it's basically just, it's basically a, um, um, tell me what we know on that subject. And I didn't call it a cat or, or something like that because it might be, it might be a bit, uh, in the future it might involve a bit of complication. For example, data sets, it might tell you when the last backup was actually taken as opposed to when you specified it and stuff like that. Uh, give me give me one second. I just wanted to show um, so edit stewards for example. So if I say that, then um, then uh, it asks me for the uh, passphrase because it, as part of the command it um, it demands this and I will get an error message if I see this correctly. Uh, yep, because I don't have my editor set. <laughs> so it's all very basic. Uh, so if I set editor equals vi say. Do this again, and also unmount it again when, whenever, uh, whenever you quit or when the thing fails. Um, and so here is my, you know, initial set of stewards. And so you know, I can just edit the list of stewards here. I just added this morning. This is the um, this is what's in Git. Here is uh, some example files. This is how this is supposed to look like. So there are
time, so otherwise it would end this one. But, but basically, some of the optional and some are uh, required fields. Here, you just, we just need a name and the date when the steward accepted that they were going to do that. <coughs> and um, they are keyed by, by these kind of keys here, uh, which then get matched in a separate file that has the uh, fractional um, secrets. Actually, maybe I should uh, show you this. Um, let me uh, take another. Um, so here we are, and now we currently mount it, so I can show you what's in the, in the mounted um, LUX volume. So it has a lost and found. <laughs> it is its own X4 file system. And so there is, uh, there is a bunch of different files. The data sets, is, which describes you know, where our data is. Um, the secrets is where it uh, records which steward got which piece of the, uh, of the, uh, of the secret. The steward's file we're currently editing. And I'm editing it as a temp file so that I'm not messing up the configuration if there's syntax errors and stuff like that. And then there's some user info. That's really all there is to it. <coughs> 